we can keep our power. You know, hold on to our power. I guess I've been playing wrong this whole time. You have been playing Monopoly wrong. What's up, YouTube? My name is Jackson, and today I'm here with billionaire, venture capitalist, and Bitcoin bull, Tim Draper. How are you doing today, Tim? Doing great. Doing great. It's a beautiful day. Wonderful feeling. Everything's great. Awesome. So I've watched a lot of um, a lot of interviews with you, and I've noticed that you're always oh, I, in. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've okay, enjoyed. What have them. you noticed? I've enjoyed them so far, so don't worry, not a problem. But I've noticed that you're always in this location, and I haven't seen anyone ask you what's on your the whiteboard behind you. <laughs> I never know. I, it's always it varies. It's, uh, I use it for sort of brainstorming, so it could be anything. Uh, it, it's uh, plans, a lot of interesting things I'm thinking about up there, um, but probably things I thought about two or three weeks ago, and now either I've done them or they're out of sight, out of mind. Uh huh. Anything you're particularly excited about? I noticed just from looking there, it looks like you've got Dai on there. Is that in reference to uh, MakerDAO's cryptocurrency, or is that something different? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a, an owner of uh, some Maker and a big fan of it. I I am um, I'm excited. It um, it brings you know Bitcoin's really the the ultimate solution, making it all crypto and all. Um, but this is a nice bridge. Uh, that allows uh, us to kind of bridge our current banking system with the post-banking world. Uh, once the banks are, um, you know, have uh, have either transformed themselves or gone out of business, uh, uh, this is this is what will allow the consumer to uh, move from. Uh, that that old world where it was fiat currency and it was all tied to governments and and tribal and all that to this new world that's global, transparent, decentralized, and open. Um, so it's um, I think it's exciting, and I think Maker has figured out a really nice model uh, for how uh, how they're going to uh, match the old world with a new world. Mm -hmm. So I was I was watching but when ultimately it down the road. I see this as a Bitcoin economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was watching um, an interview you did with Bloomberg where you said that when you're investing, you look at industries that have the uh, worst service for the highest cost. So at Draper Associates, the way we look at the next big thing is we look for industries where you're getting really bad service at a really high cost. Is MakerDAO, is DAI an example of a solution you see to an industry that gives a poor service for a high cost? Yeah, yeah, banking and finance. Um, finance, I can say that because I'm in the finance world. Um, I believe that uh, banking provides uh, bad service at a high cost at this point uh, because I mean, they're charging two and a half to four percent every time you swipe a credit card, and we're not getting real value for that. Uh, it it can be done with Bitcoin for almost frictionlessly, almost free. Um, it can be uh, done so many in so many ways in a better way than it's being done, and the banks are getting um, more and more. Um, where they're charging fees for things that they never used to charge fees for. So I, I get the feeling that this is like the, the roar of the dying lion. Uh, they're, they're trying to hold on, they're clinging to their, their past uh, glory, but, uh, but really the world is moving in a new direction and they, uh, they either are gonna get on board or they're going to uh, become extinct. So this is a really exciting time. And yes, it is. They do provide bad service at a high cost. And, and there are very few of them. 
and they they have sort of monopolistic moat because if you wanted to start a bank today to compete with them it, it would cost you 50 million dollars it would uh, that's a huge moat no one really wants to start a new bank today um there are very few people do and and uh i think if banks um they have that moat they have this oligopoly and so we all have to deal with whatever they all start throwing at us and if one group charges decides hey instead of two and a half to four percent we're going to charge three to five percent all of a sudden we're all paying three to five percent or the the merchants are um and then we have to pay by um, osmosis they this is uh a very um it, it's interesting but banks aren't the only group that are providing bad service at a high cost uh, because they're an oligopoly uh, because crypto uh, bitcoin blockchain smart contracts you combine them with an actuary and you have an insurance company and insurance also provides bad service at a high cost and that's why you know you see all these ads for insurance companies trying to you know get your business because they're clearly um, making a fortune off of you um, actually using a smart contract is going and using an actuary and sort of some ai i use you use ai to uh, check out fraud you can actually create a really great insurance company uh for very little um and what is government but an ins a bunch of insurance companies and so i think government is probably the industry that provides the worst service at the highest cost. And, uh, and that's true throughout the entire world. And they're all gonna have to start competing for us, at least at this virtual level, where a government can provide better insurance than they do today um, by using uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, smart contracts, artificial intelligence, and just a, a good actuary. So all these huge, huge industries are about to go through a complete metamorphosis because we now have a decentralized world. And this whole, we were always tribal and this tribalism is now global. We can, we can be global, we can operate globally. If one government is not performing, we can actually move to another government and we could move virtually to a new government. Uh, Estonia, uh, uh, Malaysia, and Kazakhstan are all working on e-governance, uh, which could be provided to the rest of the world, not just the people in those countries, uh, to the rest of the world uh, without uh, having people have to live there. And so that creates this sort of virtualization and competition amongst governments uh, and it's a whole new way of thinking and i think in their guts the governments and the politicians all understand that they are um, losing their old world and in some cases those governments are saying hey we're going to be the leader in this new world and that's like when Japan says Bitcoin's a national currency, or when Malta accepts all of the blockchain and uh, crypto companies through Malta, or, or Estonia creates this uh, virtual residency program. They're realizing that this is all changing and they are okay and they are going to lead that change. Other countries are saying, we're gonna control it all because we like the old way and we're going to live under the old way so we can keep our power, you know, hold on to our power. Uh, and they, they're a little bit maniacal about it uh, because there are vested interests that really don't want to see this future, at least until they're retired. Um, but there are also uh, this new generation. You know, if you ask the average 30 year old, if they'd rather have a Bitcoin or $10,000, they'd all take the Bitcoin. If you ask somebody who's, you know, 45 or older, except for me, 45 or older, they'd always take the dollars. 
because they're living in different worlds. The, the younger people are saying, whoa, this is a global world. We're open, we're, we are transparent. We like the, the openness of the world. In fact, you know, that old world of currency put me in debt of $200,000 because I was, you know, I went to a good school. Um, and I, that's, that's not my currency, that's their currency. I don't like their currency. I want my currency. I want to move with Bitcoin and I want to be on the blockchain and I don't have to be tied to a, an existing tribal government. I can be open to the world and, and uh, free and all the transactions will be very honest because they'll be on the blockchain and there won't be that, that friction that's created by regulation where regula regulators kind of create friction and that friction creates corruption ultimately, because um, if someone stands between you and getting and you getting what you want done, um, that's always some weird form of negotiation. And if they have a regulation that they can cling to that says you can't do this until you get past me, then they have this extra power over you and they that breeds corruption. Fortunately, in the U.S., uh, it has been very little corruption, but that's because it used to be a very a relatively unregulated country. Now we have extraordinary regulation here. It's very high regulation and it is breeding more corruption. And it, that scares the heck out of me because I've always loved the land of the free and the home of the brave. It reminds me of a, a quote that you made in an interview with us a couple of years ago where you said, Freedom equals prosperity, and regulation equals poverty. Freedom equals prosperity, regulation equals poverty. Do you think that any sort of regulations are necessary to protect consumers? I mean, where, where do you draw the line here between... Well, I think you need experience? regulations when people are, um, are, at that point, not creative enough to create a market system to solve a problem. So regulation should be an interim step and they should be temporary until there's a market system that solves the regulation. Cap and trade is the market system that solves for carbon emissions where regulation is just, you can't pollute. Um, and I think what really, I, I think in, the, in a perfect world, um, the regulators would, would allow for innovation to happen until there was an outcry that was, that was a really big outcry from a lot of people saying, this is not fair for us. And then the regulators can come in and say, should we regulate? Or is there an entrepreneurial solution? Is there a market solution that we can create that allows, um, that will incentivize people to do the thing, do the right thing, do the thing we want them to do? Um, and, and I think uh, what's happened though is like, um, there are regulations from 1933, 1940, they're 80 years old, and somehow those regulations are dictating what happens with the ICO market and the um, airdrops and whatever else. And it's all dictated by something that happened 80 years ago. It makes no sense. That should have all been sunsetted after. I mean, I don't think any regulation should last more than 20 years. After those 20 years, if you want to re-up the regulation, great. You think it's still a good thing? Great. But during that time, a lot has happened and a lot of different market systems have evolved. We don't have to live by some, just because somebody wrote it 80 years ago, we don't have to live by that. We can re, rethink it. It can be a market system. Um, and so, yeah, I do think the, the higher the regulation, I mean, you're going to, you're going to see you heavily regulate, China, they're getting heavily regulated now. Their economy is was booming, and now it's flattening off. Um, I mean, the ultimate is a socialist economy. Russia, 
everything's regulated, right? It's all determined by government. They tell you, you're going to be an ice skater. You have to become an ice skater. You're going to be an engineer. You have to become an engineer. <laughs> and, and it's all done by the guys at the top. And the guys at the top determine what everybody else has to do. And that was Russia for many, many years. Their economy was total flat line. Meanwhile, the U.S. economy was booming. And finally, the wall fell down. They recognized that they needed a market system in there. They built their market system. And now, for some reason, they've got leadership that's saying, let's go back to this socialist economy where we can control all of you people. Um, I, I think that hubris, you know, anybody who says, yeah, socialism works has never, it's never worked. Capitalism hasn't worked everywhere, but socialism has never worked. So the fact that we have two presidential candidates, two who claim to be socialists and they're, they're doing okay in the polls makes me think like, does anybody study history? Does anybody understand what has happened in the past? This is ridiculous. Socialism creates poverty. That whole, all that regulation, all that government control creates poverty. You, the, the closer the decision making is to the top, the worse a country does. Socialism doesn't work. They don't understand human motivation. The drive of humans the, the incentive to allow a human to achieve what they want to achieve uh, is so powerful. And by, uh, by subverting it with regulation saying, you can't do this, um, actually uh, it ruins motivation. And people used to, people in Russia used to say, um, they, pre they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Uh, is that really the economy you want? No, you want an economy where people are driven and motivated and they know they're going to make big money if they're successful, make huge sacrifices to get where they're going. All those things, uh, I think those are really critical for a big economy. So you clearly seem to have a lot of faith in the free market and the positives of competition. Do you, do you see Bitcoin as the ultimate form of capitalism? No, but it frees up, uh, Bitcoin frees up the world. Uh, it, it allows us to do business anywhere in the world without um, friction so that we can, we can uh, pay employees somewhere else. We can... Uh, uh, send money to our relatives somewhere else. We can uh, operate. We can we can hold money um, anywhere that that we can pull down anywhere in the world. I mean, imagine being some Syrian refugee, and you're and you you had a lot of money in Syria, and now you are going and you're in Greece, and you have nothing, and you're a refugee, and they they don't accept your Syrian money. You're screwed. But if you uh, if you had Bitcoin, you would just go to Greece. You pull down your Bitcoin. You buy a house. You start your life over. Everything's fine. Um, and you go get a job. You get it all going. Uh, the the world doesn't end. Well, um, you know, I there are military dictators out there. They they make life life miserable for some people. Some of them um, push people out because of what they believe. Some people push them out for one reason or another. Sometimes they have just horrible uh, ways of operating. Um, and so people have to leave those countries. Well, if they're stuck with currency in their own country, uh, they're, they're stuck. Nobody's going to take that currency. The dictator's currency, who wants that? Um, so why not have Bitcoin? But my original question was, what, is Bitcoin the ult ultimate form of capitalism? And I think you said no. Why, why, why don't you think so? Well, because it's not 
the whole system. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying Bitcoin is a currency uh, that's global and open, transparent, wonderful, everything's great, frictionless. Um, it, it's not the whole capitalistic system. Uh, you you need buyers and sellers and you know suppliers and customers and uh, there are a whole bunch of things that make up capitalism um, and a, a fair market system, free and fair market system. Uh, there are a lot of things that make up capitalism, but uh, Bitcoin can actually help spread good business around the world. And, and I guess that would spread capitalism around the world. But um, yeah, ultimately, it, it's a better form of government. And, uh, and for some reason, the, uh, there are people who still feel like the socialism or some some other form is going to work better. I, ju I just don't see it. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm kind of curious. It never has. I mean, you go back in history, it never has. Uh -huh. Zero. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Do you think you could give me a ballpark of how much Bitcoin you own? Why would I do that? You ever <laughs> play Monopoly? Do you, do you yeah. tell everybody how much money you got when you play Monopoly? Well, you got to show it, right? No, you don't. No. I guess I've been playing wrong this whole time. You have been playing Monopoly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there's oh, uh, you never show your cards. I'll, I'm going to remember that for next time. Um, that'll that'll make my friends angry for sure. <laughs> um, so, if there's one piece of advice you could give to someone looking to invest in crypto, what would it be? Do it. Do it. It's the future. Mm -hmm. It it just makes perfect sense. It's the future. It's a and it's a positive future. It's a future of peace and love and openness and transparency. It's a future that we all want. How do you feel uh, about how do you feel about privacy coins? Um, honestly, I don't think that they're going to be private. Mm -hmm. I think people will figure out how to how to find out who's on that blockchain. I do you know, and that's it's a little bit like, you know, hey, oh, there are all these criminals and they're and they're using um, uh, crypto to do their crimes. If you're a criminal, you should be using cash because, you know, there is no way you're going to get away with it if it's on the blockchain. <laughs> there is a perfect record of every transaction that sits there on the blockchain. You, it doesn't make any sense for a criminal to try that. Throughout this interview and other interviews that I've watched, you have this very forward-thinking mindset. How, how do you cultivate this mindset in order to spot opportunities that others, other people may not notice as much? I don't think, um, I don't think it's necessarily just inherent in me. I think anyone can do it. I, everyone I meet is telling me about what their future is. They're all saying, hey, I got this new deal. I got a new company. This is what we're going to do. This is what it's going to look like. So I meet with all these people. You know, it can be as many as 15 in a day. And uh, and I, I might hear 15 pitches in a day. It starts putting pieces together for me of what that future might look like. And then I can make my judgment as to what um, what investments I might make based on the future I've learned from all of that. And then I also have lived a long life. So I, um, I, I get to look back in history and say, you know, what has worked and what hasn't over all that period of time. So um, it's, uh, I guess, just because that's what I've been doing. That's what I'm better at. Um, like, if I were a journalist, I would know much more what's going on in the world right now, right today. Um, but I wouldn't really have a sense for what's going to happen tomorrow uh, because it just happens and then I, I bring it in and it's a part of my life. 
But if I'm a venture capitalist, all I care about is what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years. I see your point. And being a journalist in the crypto industry is particularly nuanced, I think, because every all the topics that we deal with are all about the future, you know? So <laughs> we get a little bit of both. Well, you're a little say. bit of a combination because you're a crypto and you're a journalist. And you so you, you see what's going on in crypto today mm -hmm. and you get what crypto is going to be bringing to the world tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah, everything at least going, you have that good sense. Yeah, everything going on in crypto today is about what's going to happen tomorrow. At least, right. yeah, at least it seems that way to me anyway. Um, and I guess one final question. Um, because I, I'm still curious about what kind of criteria you use to evaluate these pitches and I guess crypto companies specifically. Are there other things you look at besides these uh, uh, worst service, high cost um, when you're really reviewing a company and dis or a coin when you're deciding whether or not to invest in it? Well, I'm, I'm evaluating the people who are working on it. Uh, as much as anything and the market size of what they're going after. And then my biggest question is, what if it works? What if you're successful? Have we created a, a happier, more peaceful, loving, open, wealthy environment? Or have we created uh, a, a military dictatorship? And I think you, you look and you say, I want an open, free, peaceful, loving world. And that's what you'll get if you back this entrepreneur. And if you, and then if, if they're successful, it happens. If they're not successful, they at least push the ball forward in that direction. So <clears throat> yeah, so that's, uh, those are the things I look for. What if the big question, what if, yeah, what if it works? No, what if it works if as it opposed works? to what could go wrong? Uh -huh. What could go wrong? There's plenty of things can go wrong. <laughs> if you're a startup, you're going to go through a lot of things that go wrong. Uh huh. For sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. That was incredibly interesting, and I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you, everyone, for watching. My name is Jackson, and that was Tim Draper. And guys, always remember to like, subscribe, and hodl. Coin Telegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.